All right, Mark chapter 6. The very end of it, we left off last time uh, with the death of John the Baptist. Today, we're kicking off with Jesus feeding the 5,000. We, we see this account throughout, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, the, the, the synoptics. We see it, you know, he feeds the 5,000 and he feeds the 4,000. So when we get to the 4,000, we're, we're probably not going to be spending a whole lot of time um, on that one. Uh, that is really even assuming that the 4,000 is in Mark. But um, we're, we're going to spend some time here to talk about what Jesus has done. So let's go ahead and read verses 30 through 44, uh, and then we will talk. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. If you recall, they had, they had been sent out two by two by two by two by two by two. All, all 12 of them had been sent out in order to preach, to proclaim the gospel, to, to remove uh, demons, spirits, uh, to, to do whatever they could. And so then we get this little snippet of John the Baptist, and then it says the apostles returned. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. All right, so the, the, the disciples, the apostles here, as they are called now, have come back. They've returned. And when they get to Jesus, you can imagine how excited they were to talk to him, huh? They've just gone out and they've been... They've been cleansing demons from people. They've been healing people. They've been preaching. And, and it says they told him all that they had done and taught. Can you imagine them vying for his attention? Jesus, li listen to what I've done in your name. Listen, listen to what I've, I've accomplished because of you. And I, I just, that one verse I think has so much in it because I know that Jesus took the time to listen to each one of them, to make sure that they felt heard, to make sure that they understood that what they had done was important. And I think sometimes we, we see people doing things and we see people doing them for the Lord and, and, and they want to tell us about it. We're like, yeah, I, I know what you did. It's okay. Listen to them. Let them talk about what they've done for God and commend them for that. And if, if it's something that's, that's not necessarily even for the Lord, if it's somebody who's just excited about something, listen to them. Let them talk to you. Encourage them. It's so important that we, that we listen. And Jesus said, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Having heard all that they've done, having, having listened to them, he, he realizes that they're, they're probably tired, huh? They're tired. So come away and rest. It says many were coming and going. They had no leisure even to eat. Y'all ever been so busy that you forget to eat? It's happened to me before. Been so busy I forgot to eat. Especially when I was younger, playing video games. Busy, right? But then there are days where I'm, I'm so busy that I don't have time to eat. Now, it hasn't happened a lot because I've, I've made myself just go eat because it's important. We need to eat. But the disciples and Jesus, they were, they were so busy dealing with people. 
helping people, preaching to people. They didn't even have time. They didn't have leisure to eat. They were busy, huh? Very busy doing the work and the will of God. And then in verse 32, it says, they went away in the boat to a desolate place. So they, they are on the, they're on the shore talking to people, and then they get into the boat, and they, they start going along the water. Now, when I, when I did a little bit of research into this particular thing, because you think a boat traveling across water in a straight shot, and then you have all these people in verse uh, 33, they saw them going, and they recognized them. They ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead, right? So you've got the boat going in a straight shot, and then you've got these people running along the edge of the water, and they get there before the boat does. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because what, what, what's the fastest way to get from A to B? Is a straight line. What were they doing in the boat? Going in a straight line. And they weren't the fastest. <laughs> in fact, the people that were running on foot got there first. Well, on a windless day in this area, it is possible to walk around the sea in about 10 hours. Possible to walk around the sea in about 10 hours, and, and that, that may be faster than the boat if you're having to row the whole time, if it's a, you know, if, if, if it's a pretty decent-sized boat. These people ran. They ran 10 miles to get to see Jesus. Anybody in here run 10 miles right now? I don't know that I've ever been able to run 10 miles straight. 10 miles they ran because, because why? Because Jesus was there. Because they wanted to see the Christ. They wanted to see the Messiah. They wanted to hear more of what he had to say. And so they got there. And when he went ashore, Jesus gets to the shore and he sees a great crowd. All the people from the surrounding towns and villages, he sees them. And what does he say? What does it say about that? He says, he had compassion on them. He loved them. He saw them as if they were sheep without a shepherd. And what do we know about Jesus? What is he? He is the great shepherd. And what are we? The people of his pasture. And so he sees them. He begins to teach them. Because this is what they need. And it's interesting when we consider people in need, when, when we see people who are, who are lost, who are in, in need of help, certainly there are the physical things that we ought to provide, but what does Jesus do for these people who are in need? It's the first thing he does. He teaches them. He proclaims to them many things, it says, presumably about the kingdom of God. I don't think Jesus was teaching them about the Olympics at that time. He's talking to them about God's kingdom about the love of God, about, about how they can have hope and how they need to repent, to change their life. And, and he's teaching so long, it, it grows late. Probably the sun is coming down at this point and, and, and the disciples, they come up to him, they're like, teacher, teacher, Jesus, send them away. It's, it's late let them go into the surrounding countryside. Let them go into the villages and find something to eat. We can't feed them. They're, they're not going to be able to eat. You need to send them away now. Anytime the disciples tell Jesus to do something, it just blows my mind. <laughs> to have the, the, the gall to be able to look at Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, and to say, you need to do this. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. I, it blows my mind. You'd think the question might be, Jesus, what shall we do about these people? What, what could we do for these people? How can we help? No, no, no. Jesus, you need to send them away. You're done teaching for tonight. Stop preaching, Jesus. Now, I get to be told to stop preaching. Jesus doesn't get to be told to stop preaching, Right? And then in verse 37, Jesus responds, and this is just almost, growing up an only child, I didn't have this interaction, but I saw it with my friends who had siblings. 
You know, you do this. No, you do this. I almost see Jesus' response, not in a sarcastic, childish way, but a, you give them something to eat. You know they need to eat. You want them to eat. You give them something to eat. You do this for them. Challenging them, testing them. What, what are you going to do? How are you going to feed these people? And the disciples, I, I mean, in all honesty, rightfully so, they're, they're confused. Which do we need to, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? I mean, that's... 200 days wages. Are we going to spend half of a year's wages to, to feed these people for one night? You think of your annual salary spending more than half of it on one day to feed people bread? It's pretty crazy, huh? Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? How much bread is there already? He doesn't ask about fish. He's just asking about bread. How much? How many loaves are there? He says, go and see. So who are these, presumably, who are the disciples going to ask about bread? The people that are there. They're likely going to ask about the people who are surrounding them, the 5,000. Now, I don't know if these 5,000, most of them probably did not come prepared to be there all day and all night and to have food. And maybe they brought some snacks to eat along the way. We don't really know, but, but they come back and they said, we've got five loaves of bread and two fish. That's, That's what we have found. You asked us to go find out, we found out there are five loaves, there are two fish. And so Jesus commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. 5,000 men, it says, there's... Uh, Possibly women and children here as well, outside of the 5,000. There's, there's some debate on whether or not that 5,000 men is inclusive of 5,000 people, 5,000 mankind, or if it is 5,000 men plus women and children. Regardless, at the very bare minimum, Jesus is feeding 5,000 people. And he has them sit down in groups by 50s, by 100s, and he takes the loaves of bread, he, he takes the fish, and, and he divides them among the people. He says a blessing to God. He divides among the people, and, and, and everybody ate. Everybody was filled. Now, if I am those people, and I see that I have been fed where there was no food before, no, not really, I might think that this Jesus is something quite special. Huh? I've just ran 10 miles to come and see him. He's taught me. He's performed a miracle and fed me. Maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the coming one. Maybe this is the Savior. And in verse 45, we see that it says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. Why would Jesus need to dismiss the crowd without his disciples? Don't you think it would be a little helpful to dismiss 5,000 people with a little bit of help? You think that maybe having those extra 12 apostles and, and, and the other disciples that we know were with him, because we know that there was another apostle chosen, don't you think it might be a little easier to dismiss a large crowd with a little extra help? So what then is the reason for Jesus sending them on ahead? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. One is that Jesus knew that these people, uh, as they have really throughout the whole gospel account, are wanting to crown him king or wanting to make him something special because they believe he is the king. They believe he's the coming king, the, the Jewish king that's going to rule over the world in a physical way. Manner and, and somebody who's doing these miracles, how could he possibly not be that? How could he possibly not be the leader of the people? And he doesn't need his disciples to be falling in line with that, does he? So it's possible that that's a reason. The other explanation really is that he wanted some alone time, which I think is uh, more likely. I think the first is probable. The second one is, is definite. Verse 46, we'll read through the end of 52 here. It says, after he had taken leave of them, he went up, on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, 
And he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. That when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So Jesus has his disciples go across, and he goes up on the mountain to pray. He's just had a long, long day, hasn't he? He has had a really long day. And what does he do at the end of that long day? He spends time talking with his father. He spends time alone in prayer without anybody else around. We don't know what he prayed about. We don't know what he prayed for. And that's the point. We know that he prayed. He talked to God. And then evening comes around. And the boat's already out on the sea, but it's not going very far because not only is there, you know, the wind's not, it's not that it's not there, it's actually against them. They're, they're going into the wind, and so they're having to, to fight against the wind. It says the fourth watch of the night, so it's, it's dark. It's dark right now. And Jesus comes by walking on the sea. He's walking on water. Now, the other accounts tell us that, that uh, Peter sees him, and Peter walks on the water too, and Jesus catches him, pulls him back up. Here, we don't have that account. We just have that Jesus is walking by, and, and he's, he's meaning to pass by. He doesn't even want to stop. He wants to keep going and meet them on the other side. Can you imagine the, the, the disciples' faces <laughs> if they had docked the boat, and Jesus is standing there waiting for them? <laughs> Where were you guys? I've been waiting. Jesus is, is just absolutely incredible in all that he does. And as they see him, they think that he's a ghost. I, I, I don't understand why they thought he was a ghost. Maybe they've seen ghosts before. And so this is something that, that they've seen. I, I, don't, I don't really know. But, but this is what they think. It's the fourth watch of the night. They're tired. They've been, they've been making headway against the wind. They, they see something on the water. Certainly it can't be a man because people don't walk on water. And yet, they cry out. They're, they're, they're scared. They're terrified. And, and Jesus tells them, do not be afraid. Take courage. Take heart. Be strong and courageous. And do not be afraid. These words might have been something that... that would have hearkened them back to hearing about Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Would have given them the, the, the courage to be okay. So Jesus gets in the boat. The wind ceases. And then it says they did not understand about the loaves. Their hearts were hard and they, they didn't get it. They didn't understand that this, this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. This is the Savior. This is God in the flesh. And so they cross over. We're not going to spend much time here. Jesus, you know, we, I, I don't want to make, you know, nothing about this because it is, it is incredible and it is important. But he heals the sick again, right? That, that's what he's doing. He is healing the sick. And it says that they... Uh, they, they ran about the whole region, the people, and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. I mean, they are desperate to find the Christ. They are seeking him out. They are running to him. They are bringing everything of import to him. In fact, so much so that they laid in the marketplaces, just in the city where they thought he might be, so that they might touch the fringe of his garment. Not even to speak to him, not to talk with him, not to have him touch them, but that they might touch the fringe of his garment. How close are we trying to get to Jesus? 
Are we running to and fro in our lives to run towards Jesus? Are we doing everything in our power to get close enough just to touch the hem of his garment? Or are we expecting him to come to us? Are we expecting Jesus to come here and to say, all right, well, you need to do this, this, and this? Or are we going to him? Are we seeking him out in his will? Because we see all throughout the scripture, that's what people do. They seek out the Christ. They hear about him and they seek him out, and we too need to do that. Any thoughts on chapter 6 before we move forward? Just that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to try to sum that up. Um, so wish me luck. So one of the things that, that Brother Meyer is talking about is, is in about 60 years ago, uh, John F. Kennedy came to, to Dallas in a, in a month. And as you all are aware, terrible, awful thing that occurred. But if you recall in the pictures, or maybe you uh, were, were watching it on TV, the, the streets were lined in Dallas all the way up, um, all the way on the green, uh, everywhere, just lined. And it used to be that, I mean, we can see videos of when, uh, well, that's what came to mind, the Beatles came to America, right? And, and what, did, what did all of the girls do when the Beatles came? They lined up and started screaming and yelling, right? We, we, we did it for rock stars, we did it for all sorts of people. Um, you know, we, in, in England, the Queen, anytime the Queen went anywhere, what did, what did people do? They lined up. Well, we're talking about not just somebody of import, but, but the most important person to have ever walked the face of the earth who didn't just have celebrity status, but healed people too, but gave them hope, gave them life. And so, yeah, there, there are going to be great crowds and they're going to seek him out. And that's something that I think we, we kind of lose sight of, as Brother Myron alluded to with our, you know, with our fancy tech. We have, we have the world at our fingertips, and so we're a little jaded as to some of these things. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing that we don't gather in crowds to see celebrities anymore, but, but point being, Jesus was the man. He was the guy, and everybody, everybody wanted to see him. So we get to chapter 7, and we have the, the, these, these traditions and these commandments and in, in verse 1, it says, The Pharisees gathered to him some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. All right, so the, the correction that is made there is that their hands are not defiled. They are unwashed. They're unclean. And so the word defiled here, we have to understand where, where Jesus is coming from, what he is meaning, what he is talking about. This is a defilement of the heart of the soul. This is not, uh, it's a sin, right, is, is what to be defiled is. And Jesus is, is saying that to, to not wash the hands is, is not a sinful thing. Now, we ought to wash our hands before we eat. We'll make that pretty clear. That, that's a, you know generic thing that we ought to do because it's a healthy thing to do, but it is not sinful if we don't. It is not sinful if we don't. 
Verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, properly holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. You guys ever wash your couch? You scrub it down, take a hose to it. I mean, you wash your couch. The, the, the Jewish people had so many traditions, so many things that were passed down that were not God's commands, but were based off of God's commands that they, 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 they kind of morphed them into their own things, their own commandments, their own traditions that they expected people to follow. The washing of hands being one, the washing of, of cups and pots, copper vessels, dining couches, all the things. I mean, they, 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 they viewed this, they viewed these traditions as if, if you did not do them, you were sinful. You were lost. You were going against God. So the Pharisees and scribes, they come up and they ask him, and they ask him specifically, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? They're not asking, why do your disciples not walk according to the commands of God? But why do they not walk according to the traditions of elders? And Jesus, man, he's, uh, he knows how to hit hard sometimes. He said, he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? Hypocrites. I mean, just right to the jugular, right? He says, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain, vain worship, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, teaching as law, the commandments of men. Jesus tells them, listen, you scribes, you Pharisees, you got it all wrong. You're just a bunch of hypocrites. You think that you are teaching God's law, but you're just teaching man's law. You're more worried about what people think than you are about what God thinks. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And then he gives an example. He says, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. So their parents are struggling. They, they, need, they need help. They need, they need money. They need food. They need clothing. They need whatever. And, and these, these, tra these, these traditions, these elders, these people, they're saying, well, what I would have given to you, I just went, I gave it to God. So it's, it's, it's okay. I, you know, I don't have to worry about you because I've given it to God. Well, that's nullifying exactly what it was that God wanted them to do. God wanted them to take care of their parents. Honor your father and your mother. Brethren, we have to be careful that we don't, we don't use the things that we do to get away from responsibilities as an excuse by saying that I'm doing this for God. We must serve the Lord, and, and, and in serving God, we serve others. The first and the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is what? To love your neighbor as yourself. And who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Well, Jesus answered that with the parable of the Good Samaritan, didn't he? Which of these proved to be a neighbor? Your neighbor is the person sitting right next to you. Your neighbor is the person who lives right next to you. Your neighbor is the person who you meet on the street. Your neighbor is everybody. Who proves to be a neighbor? Any thoughts there? Cool. Let's talk about the heart, shall we? He called the people to him again, said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. Again, that word defile, pay attention to it. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. 
When he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. Then he said, and he said, what comes out of the person is what defile him from, from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. That word defile is, is talking about the, the sin that resides in us, the defilement before God. Jesus is not saying here that if you eat uh, bad food, you can't get food poisoning. It's not what he's talking about with this defilement. Obviously, if we eat something that's bad, it's going to cause us problems. He's talking about what defiles us before the Lord, what defiles us before God. But he does make all foods clean here, right? The Jews are not allowed to eat certain things, correct? Dietary restrictions. Jesus is saying, listen, it's not about what comes, what, what you eat. That's not what makes you unclean. Eating bacon is okay, guys. We're good. We can eat bacon. But what comes out of the heart? Evil thoughts. Sexual immorality. Theft. Murder. Adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. These things, this is what defiles the heart. This is what defiles the soul. You want a list of thou shalt nots? Thou shalt not have evil thoughts. Thou shalt not commit sexual immorality. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not all of these things. This is our list of what not to do. These things ought not to be named among those of us who profess to be Christians. If my name, Chris Carrillo, is associated with these things, that's not good. That's awful. That is terrible. That is... They defile a person. And then we get this story of, of a Syrophoenician woman. Verse 24, he, just Jesus arose, went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he could not be hidden. Jesus wanted a little bit of alone time, didn't he? He wanted a little bit. So he enters the house. He doesn't want anybody to know where he's at. And it's possible because he knows this woman is there or is going to be there. Verse 25, immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. The woman was a Gentile, Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now we don't know what the conversation is from right from the beginning up until right now, but we know that this woman is begging Jesus. Begging Jesus. This woman has a daughter who is who is unclean, who has an unclean spirit. She wants her daughter to be healed. She knows that Jesus performs miracles and can heal. And so she comes before him. She falls down at his feet and begs him, please heal my daughter. Jesus said to her, let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That's a hard saying, isn't it? That's a difficult saying. Jesus is calling this Gentile woman a dog? I had to think quite long and hard about how this came to be, about what happened that would cause Jesus to do this and, and why he might have done it. And there, there are a couple of reasons that present themselves to us. The first, which I, I think my opinion here is, is more likely, is that in the conversation where, where she is begging Jesus, she refers to herself as a dog because she knows where she stands. She knows who she is. She knows that she's not a Jew. She knows that she's a Gentile, and she understands who Jesus has come for. 
And so she would have called herself a dog first. And Jesus would then be replying to that statement. Second possible reason is that Jesus used this term, and, and, and the word dog there is more like a, a puppy. It's not, it's not the most derogatory form of the word. It, it certainly is not ideal. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't call somebody a dog, hopefully. But the word is puppy, and it's, it's likely that what he is doing is he is testing her faith, challenging her faith to see whether or not what she wants is really what she wants. It's a difficult saying. It's one that we have to try to understand, but we have to know that Jesus did not mean to harm or embarrass or humiliate this woman. In fact, we know that he is in a house and this woman is in the house with him, likely, and there is really nobody else around. Jesus wanted to be in the house alone, and the one person that comes in is this woman. They're having a conversation, just the two of them. He's not surrounded by crowds. He's not saying this in front of other people. This is a conversation between these two, and, and the woman replies in verse 28, uh, yeah, verse 28 says, yes, Lord, Yet even the dogs, again, referring to herself here, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, knowing full well, full well, that it is not yet her time to receive the gift, but recognizing as well that, that blessings that come down from above have a way of trickling to other people, just by extension of being associated with them. A dog eats crumbs off of the table because children don't know how to eat properly and crumbs fall down. That's how it works. Jesus responds, says, for this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. The faith that she had allowed her daughter to be healed. Jesus healed a Gentile's daughter in a time where he was sent for the Jews because Jesus, Jesus is a lover of people. Jesus cares about people. All right, last one, and we will have actually gotten through everything that I wanted to get through in a Bible class, which is really exciting. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, next week, um, we're going to have, uh, Ver, uh, we're have Corey come up and, and speak. He's going to go over, Lord willing, chapters 8 and 9. I'm going to give him a lot to do because he can handle it. Um, hopefully I, I said it correctly in the last, the, the, the children are a reference to the Jewish people and, and the dogs are a reference to the Gentiles. I don't know if I made that clear, but I, I, hopefully I did. Um, verse 31 says, he returned to the region of Tyre, went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, uh, in the region of the Decapolis, and they brought him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. So two, two different things there. One stems from the other. He is deaf, so he cannot hear. He cannot hear the way the words sound. So when he speaks, it sounds off. Right, it is not the same, um, and, and the speech impediment may have been something extra as well, but they begged him to lay his hand on him, taking him aside from the crowd privately. Pay attention to this, because this is really weird. He put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephephtha, or I think that's how you say it, that is, be opened. His ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. All right, real quick, one, we, we often think of Jesus as this guy who doesn't get his hands dirty. Jesus just put his finger into somebody's ear. Just a weird thing to think about. And then Jesus it presumably spit on his finger and touched the man's tongue. We, we don't think of Jesus in those terms, those regards, do we? J Jesus is not afraid to do what needs to be done to heal somebody. And this man is fully healed after this. What, what, what I find also, this, this story to me is just comical in a lot of ways, but the other thing that I find comical is this, this phrase, be open, F -f 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 doesn't even sound like you're opening your mouth. You're just like, F -f -f -f. and that's what he says in order for this man to speak. Jesus is healing this man, and then he tells everybody, don't speak about it. And it says, the more that he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. We have a responsibility to tell people 
about Jesus. He can walk on water. He heals the blind. He heals the deaf. He makes the mute speak. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He was then. He is today. And our responsibility is to proclaim that all the more. And when people tell us to stop, we should more zealously do so. Thank you all.